Welcome to the Crystal Cathedral video series. This special edition features from the former sanctuary of the Crystal Cathedral campus in 1972, the late Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Archbishop Sheen shares his messages, Jesus Christ Superstar, Super Scar, and Christ Self-Giving, parts one and two. You have all heard a phrase which is used in psychology about transference. It is that the putting on to another of credit, blame, burden, or responsibility. Now let me give you this morning three examples of transference. Physical, financial, and moral. Physical transference. You have all seen that picture of a boy carrying another one who was a cripple. And the title of the picture was, He's not heavy, he's my brother. That's physical transference. Another form of transference, financial. This morning when I came out here early, I went to Holiday Inn and I went in to have pancake and maple syrup and a cup of coffee. And Mr. Eichenberger came in and said, uh, Dr. Schuler has already paid the bill. That's financial transference. Thank you. <laughs> if I had known he was going to do it, I would have ordered quail on toast. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about that kind of transference. I'm concerned about bringing to you the very essence of the life of our blessed Lord. And I want to show to you how he took upon himself or transferred to himself three different areas of our lives. There was physical transference, there was mental transference, and there was moral transference. He took upon himself all of our burdens and responsibilities, physical, mental, moral. He took them totally and completely. He's a God, in other words, who took his own medicine. He gave us freedom. We brought a number of ills upon ourselves, and he came and took the effects of that freedom. I can remember when I was a boy, and all of you who are over 39 can thank God that you never lived in what was known as the castor oil period of life. <laughs> but my grandmother used to give me castor oil, and before she would give it to me, she would take it herself and say, see, there's nothing to it, it's easy. She was taking her own medicine. God does that. So let us see how he took his own medicine physically. As a result of the evil in this world and abuse of freedom, we have all kinds of disease and sickness. We read in the Gospel of Matthew a prophecy taken from Isaiah that our blessed Lord took upon himself our sicknesses and our illnesses. We have no reason to believe that our blessed Lord was ever physically sick. Because it seems as if no one had any power over him until he said, all right, this is your hour to evil. They could not arrest him, they could not throw him over the precipice. So it's not likely that he was ever physically sick. How then did he take upon himself our sicknesses and our illnesses? I think by what might be called a very deep empathy. There isn't a mother in this audience or on television who, having had a sick child, has not said, I would like to take on the sufferings of that child. 
Any one of you mothers that has a delinquent daughter or a delinquent son suffers more for that son than the son suffers. Why? Because you're identified with that child. So our blessed Lord, therefore, I feel by empathy, felt all the sicknesses of the world. When, for example, he touched the blind man, I'm sure that he felt all the blindness of the universe. He felt the blindness, for example, of a Milton. All the lights of the world went out. And when he touched the deaf man, I'm sure that he felt all the harmonies of the world to cease. He felt the deafness of a Beethoven. When he touched the leper, and he touched the leper, I'm sure he felt leprosy. And that is one of the reasons why we find often that when our blessed Lord healed the sick, that he sighed. He groaned. He wept. He transferred to himself all sicknesses, lameness, and the ills to which mankind is heir to, in order that we could never say, God does not know what it is to suffer. He had it before. He took his own medicine. Then there was mental transference. Who is going to give sympathy, for example, to the mentally retarded? Does God know anything about the mentally handicapped? Then the agnostics, the skeptics, the doubters, those who have lost their faith. Does God know anything, for example, about the despair of a Sartre or a Camus? or anyone who has given up the shade and shadow of the cross for, for any kind of self-imposed guilt. God knows all about that, and he transferred all of those illnesses to himself. And in one dark moment when he was unfurled on a cross like a wounded eagle, The sun refused to shed its light upon the crime of deicide. Nature is not always sympathetic to our moods, but it was sympathetic to his. And in that darkness at midday, he took upon himself all of the mentally handicapped and all the doubts and despairs and anxieties of people and express them all in one great moment of transference. My God, my God, why? Why? Why hast thou abandoned me? It was the moment when God asked a why of God. It was the second when Christ was at the very gates of hell itself. He took his own medicine. And that is why the despairing need never despair. And the hopeless need ever be without hope. He took on their hatred, their atheism. He felt it as if it were his own. And in that moment, he redeemed all of the skepticism of the universe. And then there came one other moment. It was a bigger one, in which there was not physical transference of ills, not a mental transference, but a moral transference. 
of guilt. We're all sinners. We have a tendency to project our guilt. We blame it onto other people. Blame it on the God, we blame it on the church, we blame it on the government, we blame it on neighbor. So there's a tremendous pile of garbage someplace in this world. And all of that guilt that we have projected, he had to take upon himself to clear it out. Believe me, the only pollution that is in this world is not in the atmosphere. There's a moral pollution that is far worse. And that he took upon himself in his death. And he took all sins upon himself as if he himself were guilty. And that was why, for example, when in the courtroom of Annas he was accused of being blas a blasphemy, he did not answer because we are blasphemed. Seven times he spoke before Pilate, seven times he was silent. Seven times he spoke as shepherd, seven times he was silent as the sheep, the victim of lamb that had to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And so every, any sin that we have ever committed, of mind or heart or body, he took upon himself and paid the debt as if it were his own. This was the greatest of all of his acts of transference. And then when he rose from the dead, then he made it possible for us to say, well now, I'm forgiven. He's conquered. Conquered all of this evil. And we give ourselves completely and totally to him. So gather up then, if you please, all of the ills that have afflicted mankind. He bore them all on a tree. Think as if mankind were today afflicted by a plague. And suppose this plague was like the Black Death that destroyed over one third the population of Europe at the close of the Middle Ages. Suppose some great scientist here in California developed a cure for the plague. And he made it available for everyone. Would we go? There would be some who say, well, how do I know he's got a cure? Why should I bother going to a laboratory? I can take care of myself in my own home. And so we would die of the plague. And that's the way it is with the cross of Christ. He has the remedy for resignation to his will and physical and mental suffering. He has the remedy for sin, forgiveness at the cross. And all who come to him are healed. The looking at Christ on the cross. Remember when the Egyptians, I mean the Israelites crossing the desert, were bitten by poisonous serpents. And God said to Moses, make a serpent of brass that looks just exactly like that serpent. And hang it up on the crotch of a tree. And everyone who looks at that serpent on the crotch of that tree will be healed of the snake bite. Now that's crazy. There's nothing that will cure a snake bite by looking at a brass serpent. But it was a type of something else. And later on when our blessed Lord came, he had a conversation with Nicodemus. And he said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent of brass on the tree, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. When our blessed Lord was lifted up on that cross, he was like that brass serpent. That brass serpent 
had no poison in it. But the serpent looked as if it were poison. When Christ was on the cross, he looked as if he were guilty because he bore all of our sins. But there was no more guilt or sin in him than there was poison in that serpent. And all who look upon him are healed. This is the saving Christ who transfers all our guilt to himself and we need only ask for his pardon. And we can continue this in our own lives and help redeem souls. I remember some years ago there was a woman wrote to me and told me to visit a brother of hers. He was in a hospital dying of cancer. She said that he was a very evil man. He tried to destroy the morals of the young. And he now had developed a hatred of God and everyone. And she said, he's throwing out 10 priests. Will you please go to see him? Last resort, she. So I knew I wouldn't be treated any better than anyone else. And so I opened the door with the first night and I said, good evening, William, and closed the door. Next night I came back, said, good evening, William, how are you? Closed the door and I went down for 40 nights straight. But I never mentioned the subject of religion because I knew I'd be thrown out. And the last night I said, William, you're going to die tonight. He said, I know it. You want to make your peace with God? He said, no. Get out. So I knelt down alongside of his bed. And I promised the good Lord that if he would show some sign of repentance before he died, that I would build a church for the black people in Alabama. Now, I wasn't very well able to do that because I was a professor and my salary was $1,800 a year. And the church I promised was only 3,500, I think. But at any rate, I wanted to be associated with the redemption of our Lord. And after the prayer and the promise, I said, will you make your peace with God? He said, no, get out. He ordered me out. I went back to him quickly and put my head alongside of his cancerous face. And I said, William, say my Jesus mercy before you die. He said, I will not. Well, I received a word four o'clock in the morning that he died. And the nurse said, about 10 minutes after you left, he started saying my Jesus mercy. And he never stopped saying it until he died at four o'clock in the morning. So there's a price tag on every soul in the world. And when we associate souls with the redemption of Christ, we too help save them. My good people, this is Christ. He's savior, not primarily teacher. Saves us from our sins. The young people today and many others know him as the superstar. That's all right. It's all right. It's beginning to know him. Beginning. But to me, he's not that. A superstar always has a star in a dressing room. The media of communication love to talk with him. And they print everything that he says. But he was not a superstar. He had no star above his dressing room. As a matter of fact, he was thrown out into a garbage heap and crucified. What is Christ if he's not a superstar? Do you know what he is? He's a superstar. For when he rose from the dead, he had five hideous scars on hands and feet and side. And believe me, there's a great deal of credit that is to be given to Thomas the Apostle. Sure, he was a doubter. Sure, he was a skeptic. But he had great worth and he, he bequeathed to us an excellent lesson. And that lesson was, I'm not going to believe anyone 
unless he can show me that he loves even to a point of sacrifice. And if Christ brought God's love to this earth, then he's got to show love even to the extent of giving his life. I want, therefore, to see some scars, some marks of love. And when I can put my finger into his hand and my hand into his side, then I'll not be incredulous. Then I will believe. This is the Christ. The super scar, the one who was wounded out of love for us. And this is the Christ we believe, this is the Christ we preach, this is the Christ we love. Thank you, bye, and God love you. And now, Archbishop Sheen's message, Christ Self-Giving, Part 1. I can remember when I was a boy, I saw the predecessor, really, of this church. I was an altar boy in the cathedral of Peoria, Illinois. And immediately on the other side of the alley, there was a, an Amish church. And the Amish people used to come at 9 o'clock in the morning and stay until 5 in the afternoon. And they would drive in 20 or 25 miles, with horses, of course. And they had a number of barns. And they stalled their horses, and they ate their dinner there. This was the original drive-in church, I should want Dr. Schuler to know. <laughs> now, I am going to... Uh, you people over here have a great advantage of me uh, over the rest. You get my better side, the back. I am going to try to bring home to you today, I think, the very essence of being a Christian, what it means. And since it is a profoundly spiritual talk, I am going to begin with a couple of examples. The first is about a Nazi guard who was on trial in Frankfurt. He said that at one time he was commissioned to burn about a thousand Jewish corpses that were piled up in a barracks. He was ordered to pour gasoline over them, set them afire. When he went up to pour the gasoline on them, all the bodies were nude except one. That was a young girl, about 18, alive. He said, what are you doing here? She said, I am a Jewess from Salonika. Do you think that I could live when all my other people are dying? Identification, point number one. Second story. There is a small group of people in Russia called the Eurodivy. Eurodivy in Russia, I am told, in Russian, means born fool. For the most part, these are Baptists. They go into concentration camps, and when they find that someone is to be punished, they ask that the scourging and the beating and so forth be given to them instead of to the guilty one. Their argument is this. If that prisoner is beaten, he will hate back. And the content of hate in the world will be increased. If, however, I love back, then I increase the content of love and forgiveness. They take on the punishment that was to be given to others. That's why they're born fools. I give these two examples to explain a text of St. Paul to the Philippians. I once heard someone read the epistle to the Filipinos not very long ago, but this was actually to the Philippians, in which St. Paul says that Christ emptied himself, emptied himself, when he became man, emptied himself of all of the appearance of glory, and took upon himself the form of a slave, 
not servant, slave. In other words, our Lord would not remain up there in heavenly headquarters when there was suffering and pain and hate and disease in this world, just as that Jewish girl wanted to be identified with her own people. So he willed to be identified also with his own creatures. And secondly, when he took upon himself the form of a slave, he took on the punishment that we deserved. For by our sins, we deserve death. He took that death upon himself as if he himself were guilty. This is why we're forgiven. He was the original Eurotivy, the born fool. What humiliation did this require for God to become enfleshed? Well, let me give this example. Suppose you were very much concerned about the way dogs acted in Los Angeles. I wanted to cover a broad area here. <laughs> they didn't obey their masters. They barked at postmen. They scratched at front doors. They snapped at grocery men. And they never obeyed an order. And you wanted to teach the dogs of Los Angeles to be good. And suppose you had the power to empty yourself. Suppose you could tear off your body, empty yourself of your body, and just keep your mind, your soul, your spirit. And you would take this soul and spirit of yours and put it into the body of a dog. The first humiliation would be Though you knew that you had a mind that could conceive the stars, you would be guided by instinct. Though you knew that you could speak words, you would only bark. And you would subject yourself to all of the limitations of that canine organism. And a second humiliation, you would have to spend the rest of your life with dogs. Knowing that you were a thousand times better. If you would find it, you, then in the end, the other dogs, instead of following your example, would turn on you and tear you to pieces. Now, if you would find it humiliating, to go into the body of a dog, what do you think it is for God to come into the body of a man? And to understand pain, identify himself with our suffering, weak humanity. Incidentally, here is the only answer there is to the problem of evil. It is asked, does, does God know anything about suffering? Does God know what it is to be a refugee? Was he ever born in a slum? Did he ever go without food for three days? Or five days, seven days? Does God know what it is to have a migraine headache? As if his head was being pierced with thorns? Does God know anything about being a refugee and driven out of one country to another? Does he know anything about being in prison? Does he know anything about the accident wards? And the people go in, come in in the darkness of night with wounded hands and feet. Yes, God knows what all of these things are. He took them and he bore them and he suffered them. 
and then conquered them by the resurrection. This was the first humiliation of emptying and self-giving, becoming like the rest of men. And secondly, he had to spend the rest of his life with stupid apostles. Slow to learn, tardy of intellect. We find it hard sometimes to deal with stupid people. Imagine the divine intellect dealing with fishermen, crude, uneducated minds, so that he would have to say the night of the Last Supper with sorrow, Philip, have I been with you all this time? And still you do not understand? Dealing with hecklers, protesters like Thomas. When our blessed Lord is talking about going to heaven, preparing a way for them, the heckler says, what do you mean a way? We don't even know where you're going. This is emptying. So he emptied himself of his glory and became man to atone for our sins. Now let us apply this to ourselves, to make it very concrete. The incarnation of Christ means incarnate, in the flesh. It means that God became enfleshed. Mary gave him a human nature. That human nature was absolutely supple in his hands. It was totally obedient to him and to the Father's will. This is what Christianity means, that Christ is now saying to us today, Peter, Paul, Mary, John, Anne, will you give me another human nature? Give me a human nature like Mary gave me one. Give me a human nature that'll be so totally mine that I can teach through it, that I can act through it, that I can suffer through it, that I can redeem through it, that I can be kind and forgiving through it. So the incarnation is not something that happened. It is something that is happening. Take this pencil. This pencil is absolutely flexible and supple in my hand. I was glad I found this in my pocket. I wanted to use it as an example and I didn't think about it before I came. But this pencil is absolutely supple in my hand. If I wanted to write the word God, it will write the word God. That's the way the human nature of Christ was in his hands. That's the way he wants our human nature to be in his hands. Suppose this pencil, however, were endowed with self-consciousness. When I wanted to write the word God, suppose it wrote the word dog. I couldn't do anything with it. It'd be useless. And so Christ can do a great deal with many of us. We're not supple in his hands. We're not obedient in his hands. And being a saint really means just giving ourselves so totally and completely to him that we're his. And the reason we get all crossed up is because, well, that upright finger is the vertical will of God. And my finger here is the horizontal, the horizontal finger is my will. And when I cross the divine will with my will, I get a cross. And in psychological language, that's a complex. I get all mixed up. Too many people today are concerned about identity. I want to be me, I want to be me. Nonsense! Who wants to be me? No lover wants to be me. First of all, it's bad, bad grammar, but we'll part from that. Nobody wants to be me. We want to be someone else's. 
When you love, I want to be thine. When we're Christian, I want to be thine. This is the essence of being a Christian. So in these brief moments, I hope that I've given to you now the challenge to give yourself totally and completely to him, be free. No, not to be my own, but to be his. I slipped his fingers. I escaped his feet. I ran and hid. For him I feared to meet. One day I passed him fettered on a tree. He turned his head and looked and beckoned me. Neither by speech nor speed nor speech could he prevail. Each hand and foot was pinioned by a nail. He could not run nor clasp me if he tried. But with his eyes, he bade me reach his side. For pity's sake, thought I, I'll set you free. Nay, take this cross, said he, and follow me. And so did I follow him who could not move, an uncaught captive in the hands of love. Thank you. Bye, and God love you. Now, Archbishop Sheen's final message, Christ's Self-Giving, Part 2. My dear friends in Christ, both inside the church and outside the church, I mean physically, not spiritually. You get my better side occasionally. <laughs> Dr. Schuler said he would send you a copy of my sermon. I wish you would send me a copy <laughs> because I don't, I never have copies of my talks. I never write them out. They're born out of long hours of meditation. And uh, then another reason is I once heard a, an Irish woman who heard a bishop reading a sermon, and she said, glory be to God, if he can't remember it, how does he expect us to? <laughs> I will therefore expect you to remember every word I said. Dr. Schuller was right. We have made great advances in ecumenism, and I hope we make many more. We're making efforts. Now, here's an effort that was made in New York not very long ago. Someone went to a policeman in New York and said, when is the best time to leave New York City in a trailer? The policeman said, at 8.30 in the morning, all the Catholics will be at Mass. The Jews will be on the golf course because they've already had their Sabbath. The Protestants will still be in bed because their services start later. And so he entered Lincoln Tunnel and passed through it without any difficulty whatever. When he got to the other end, he was hit in the back of the trailer by a seven-day Adventist who was late for work. <laughs> now, if I announce the subject that I was going to talk to you about today, you might not remember it. So I am going to tell you what it is in Greek. I asked Dr. Schuler how many of his congregation would he estimate had forgotten their Greek? 
he said seven. So for the benefit of the seven, I shall have to give you a translation of the word later on. And this word now we can introduce into the English language. It is the Greek word scallop, and it is spelled S-K-O-L-O-P, scallop. It is found in the letter of St. Paul, in which he tells about the revelations that he had received, and he said, lest he should be proud of those revelations. God gave him a scallop. Three times he asked that the scallop be removed. And God said, no. My grace is sufficient for you. You keep your scallop. Now the word scallop is translated in the... Uh, in the New English Bible is physical handicap. It is translated in the Latin Vulgate Bible as the stimulus of the flesh. In the King James Version, it's the thorn in the flesh. Now, what does the word scallop really mean? The scallop really means a stake one of these wooden poles that you drive into the ground, so it was much more than the thorn of the flesh. A scallop, therefore, is any kind of handicap that we have that we cannot get rid of. And everybody in the world has got a scallop. You have at least one, I have several. Demosthenes had a scallop. He stuttered, this great Greek orator. But he got over his scallop by putting pebbles in his mouth and practicing talking. Moses had a scallop. Moses stuttered. Suppose we realistically recited the Ten Commandments in stuttering. And, and Moses asked God many times to get rid of this scallop of his. And Moses said, I can't talk. God said, that's all right. He says, Aaron will talk for you. You keep your scallop. John the Baptist had a scallop. He was in prison. And here was the Lord working miracles. Well, it was only natural for John the Baptist to think, well, if he is the, the Lord and Savior, he certainly ought to be able to get me out of prison. And he sent emissaries to our Lord and to ask him if, if he was really the one. He was becoming doubtful because he had to bear this scallop. Now, each and every one of us have a scallop. It may be some kind of physics sickness. It could be mental illness. The fact that you have crutches, braces in a wheelchair, cancer, marriage, family troubles, wayward son, wayward daughter, the place where you work, the particular work that you are doing, and on and on. But you can think, as I talk to you, about a particular scallop that you have. Now let us ask, first of all, what the scallop of St. Paul was. There's been all kinds of speculation about this scallop. See, the Latin translation would make it out that he had trouble with his passions. Another suggestion was that he had migraine headaches. 
I think probably the real answer is he had trouble with his eyes, disease of the eyes. Because first of all, he said that he was a very unsightly appearance. And on another occasion, he slapped the high priest. And an official said, why did you strike the high priest? He said, I didn't know that he was the high priest. Then he wrote to the Galatians and he said, the Galatians would have given their eyes to me. And at the end of the letters, he said, see with what big characters I write. It could have been that, but your guess is as good as anyone. The fact is that he had a scallop and he probably tried to get rid of it because he kept a doctor with him for many of his travels, Dr. Luke. But he still had it. So what we are concerned about today is what we are going to do about our scallop, and particularly the scallop that we cannot get rid of. Not a scallop that is made of evil habits. I'm not speaking of that kind. And the answer to the problem of scallops is this. Really, it does not make a great deal of difference what happens to us. What makes the difference is how we react to what happens. That's the point. Our blessed Lord told the story of two women at a mill. Here were two stones, one on top of the other. The wheat was put in between the stones. A long pole extended from the stones. And there were two women that were grinding mills. They were under the same sun in exactly the same occupation. Same economic circumstances. One was saved. The other was lost. It doesn't make any difference what happens to us. It all depends upon how we react to what happens. Take the two thieves on either side of our blessed Lord on the cross. When they began their sufferings and were crucified alongside of our blessed Lord, they were identical in the sense that they both blasphemed and cursed our blessed Lord. Then there began to be a reaction. They couldn't get out of their scallop. The scallop was the crucifixion. One of them rebelled. The one on the left. And so he said to our blessed Lord, if you're the son of God, save thyself and us. That is sometimes the way the power of God is judged. Namely, what's he going to do to help us? To the thief on the left, God had no other power except the power to take him down from that cross. And if he did not do it, he was not God. And why did he want to be taken down? He wanted to be taken down to go on with the dirty business of stealing. Now the thief on the other side began to see that maybe I deserve this. That's sometimes a good vision of a scallop. After all, really, we all receive less blows than we deserve. We know it very well. And so this thief on the right then said to his thief on, brother thief on the left, we are suffering justly for our sins. And then looking to our blessed Lord, this man has done no wrong. 
And then he made the prayer not to be taken down. He offered the prayer to be taken up. And he said, remember me. Remember me. When thou shalt come into thy kingdom. What faith? Here was a revolutionist looking at a man on a central cross, and to him that crown of thorns was a royal diadem. The blood was as royal purple. The crucifixion was as installation. And he saw in him the giver of a kingdom. And he asked to be remembered. That was all. And our blessed Lord said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that thief died a thief, for he stole paradise. And paradise can be stolen again. Here are two reactions to exactly the same scallop, physical pain. And the two reactions that any of us can have in the face of a scallop is rebellion or acceptance. Rebellion. What did I do to deserve this? Is God good? When one says, what do I do to deserve this, one is almost implying that others deserve it. This rebellion always causes bitterness. And the other attitude is the attitude of acceptance. Well, the good Lord knows all things. He's given me this cross. It comes from his loving hands. and I'm going to take it. Then it begins to be sweet. And he carried it first. So we accept it in his cross, not apart from it. We may then eventually get to see that perhaps it was a work of love. Sometimes lovers squeeze too tight. And maybe God sometimes squeezes souls too tight. And he bruises. And when he does, then we may come to understand too that perhaps he just over many of us raises his hand in blessing. But over other souls, he lays and presses his hand upon us. And when he presses his hand on us, he leaves a scar. And when we go before him on the last day, that is what he will look for. This is the way he will be known. For all the suffering people, therefore, who are hearing me, and for all of us who have scallops that we cannot overcome, do not let pain go to waste. That is the thought that strikes me every time I pass a hospital. Love does, ne does not destroy pain, but love makes it bearable. If you lose your purse and discover that some very needy person found it, the loss is softened. How often 
lovers will say to one another when one is suffering, I wish that I could take your pain, your suffering. Every mother says that to a babe who is sick. I wish I could take it. Now that's what our Lord did. He took our pain that we deserved on account of sin. And we will therefore take any scallop that he sends us and we'll endure it. And say, dear Lord, I, I do not know why. Just as I do not understand, rather a mouse would not understand who was uh, chewing a uh, piano keys, why a very, very clever pianist would sit down with the keys and play Tchaikovsky. The mouse would say, why the disturbance of the keys? Poor mouse doesn't understand anyone who knows Tchaikovsky that well. We do not understand God's plans. And if we had the power now, each and every one of us, to take our cross, our scallop, and to bring it here in front of the choir, and throw our scallop here before that great basket of flowers, then after we had a tremendous pile of scallops The Lord would say to us, all right, now everyone go to that pile and take a scallop that you like. Do you know which one you'd look for? Your own. Bear it then out of love for the Lord. Bye and God love you.